Excellent. So we've got to deal with relative clauses today. This is our second lecture on finite subordinate clauses. And what you remember from last week is that there are three main uh, kinds of these finite subordinate clauses. We've talked about content, we've talked about comparative, and now it's time to talk about the relative clauses. So the woman who is walking the dog is my daughter. Now, chapter 12, most of this comes in chapter 12, but there's a lot of pretty complicated stuff there, so let's see if we can simplify it a bit. A relative clause, this is, I think, their first sentence, is a subordinate clause with an anaphoric relationship to the matrix, cla to the matrix clause. So the matrix clause being the whole clause in which you have a subordinate clause, and it has an anaphoric. In other words, it refers back to something in the same way that pronouns refer back to nouns, common nouns, proper nouns that you've already introduced. Anaphoric means something different in rhetoric. I have a dream It is Martin Luther King's incredible speech, and you should go back and listen to that a million times. Uh, but in, gr in grammar terms, an anaphoric relationship means it refers back to something. So Fred is a professor. He lives in Gurleyville. Two independent clauses, no subordinate clause there. The he refers back to Fred. OK. Now look at number two. Fred, who lives in Gurleyville, is a professor. The who there refers back to Fred and functions in this sentence as the subject. It's kind of like the he thing. He lives in Gurleyville, and he is a professor. What's interesting about these, right from the start, is that the stuff in the subordinate clause is less important than the stuff in the matrix clause. You always want to be thinking about that as you're writing. It's subordinated. You have the ability to put one or the other into the subordinate clause. And you want to be careful as to which one you use. And it's a finite clause. It has a subject and a predicate, a subject and a verb. So Fred, a professor, lives in Gurleyville. That's not, a professor is not a subordinate clause. It's simply a noun phrase in apposition. It plays the same role in the main clause. It's just another way of identifying it. Or it's different from the man living in Gurleyville is a professor. That's a non-finite clause, that gerund participial clause, modifying the man. So it's not a subordinate finite clause because it's non-finite. But this brings us to another very important point. These sub, uh, relative clauses are going to be modifiers. That's going to make them different from the content clauses, which are going to be complements of prepositions or complements in the sentences in which they exist because he is a professor. The object of that preposition because is he is a professor. I know that he is a professor, that he is a professor, the direct object in that clause. These relative clauses are going to be modifiers the same way that those non-finite clauses are modifiers. But let's see if we can dig into this a little bit deeper. The man who lives in Paris is a professor. So the who there functions as the subject of that relative clause. And so it's kind of cool that it patterns with the he forms. The she pronouns don't work quite as nicely on this, so I'm not being you know, unfair to women at this point. It's just easier to see these endings if we use the third singular uh, male pronoun. So the man whom I saw in Paris, I saw him. So the whom I is the subject of that subordinate clause, and the whom, which refers back to the man, is the object in that subordinate clause. I saw him in Paris, and he was a painter. Now, 
the man who or whom I gave the book to was a painter. That's one that's changing in the language at the moment. I probably would say the man who I gave the book to is a or was a painter. But the whom there could be interpreted as the object of the preposition. To whom I gave the book was a painter. And so in formal writing, in more formal writing rather than less formal writing, you probably use the whom in that construction. And then the last, which I think is interesting, the man whose house I rented. So I rented his house. That whose is the genitive, but it can function as the relative word, the relativizing word, introducing the relative clause. But it expresses it's a determiner there. I rented his house, and he is a painter. Again, we'll underline these in the self-checks. Who is interesting, though? Who is the one that we uh, tend to use with people, although not always? And it has these distinctive forms, who, whom, and whose. But notice the which, which is going to be the, the relative pronoun that's going to introduce most relative clauses, doesn't have separate nominative subject forms and accusative object forms. So the house which I rented the which there is a direct object. The house which I built is in stores. In both those cases, the which functions as the direct object. The house uh, which is in Paris is beautiful. Their which would be functioning as a nominative. That should have been one of my two sentences, forgive me. But what's fun is, and the grammar book says that this is what we do in speech, and I'm going to trust them, although it's hard to catch myself and hear what I actually do do. But the house whose roof leaks. So the roof of the house, the whose is the genitive form. And we tend to think of using who, whom, whose with people, but because it's the only genitive form, if it's going to function as a determiner, its roof leaks. Then we're going to use the whose form in that construction. Asking class if you don't see it, but I think you probably do. Now, relative clauses uh, often work with both which and that. And this has been a source of great confusion, for me at least, through the years. The book wants to distinguish between integrated and supplementary relative clauses. I learn them as restrictive and non-restrictive. So the book, which is on the table, is mine. That would be restrictive because I shouldn't have said it with any pauses. The book, which is on the table, is mine. That would be the supplementary. That would be the non-restrictive. If we pause in our speech, which we show in our writing by putting commas in, distinguishes between two kinds of relationships between the subordinate clause and the noun, the thing it's referring back to. In the book which is on the table is mine. The book, that particular book, the one which is on the table, I'm telling us which book we're talking about. So that would be an integrated relative. Whereas the book, oh, and by the way, it's on the table, which is on the table, happens to be mine. I think you'll hear that difference if you keep saying those sentences. Famously, uh, E.B. White came along and revised Will Strunk's The Elements of Style and tried to say that that is only used in the integrated and which is only used in the supplementary. And that distinction is just wrong. It's you know too bad because it is something I followed for many years of my life, but it goes. It's, it's not true. 
the more important idea that I'd like you guys to remember, not that uh, E.B. White got something wrong, but that there is this difference between relative clauses which identify the thing that we're talking about and those which just add more information, which give us supplementary information. But they're both still modifiers. It's not as though the first is considered a complement. Again, we'll underline that one too. Now, it, this too, and I think we're going to follow the book on this, although I'm not going to quiz you on it. What part of speech is the that when it's being used in a relative clause? And our textbook is pretty clear on this, page 277. And they say that it's still a subordinator. So the book which I gave her is on the table sounds very much like the book that I gave her is on the table. But they analyze that second one as different. The that doesn't refer directly back to the uh, book. But because it's still a subordinator, it opens up this gap at the end of the sentence. And it's that gap then which refers back. The book is on the table. I gave her that one. Now, I'm not going to quiz you on that. I'm not going to ask you questions to see if you understand that there's a different underlying structure to those two things. Because it seems to me it's perfectly plausible to say that that there is a relative pronoun the same way the which is. But the book, the, the, the book is clear that they want to analyze it as still a subordinator, a relative clause, not a content clause, but a relative clause introduced by a subordinator. So the final sentence, the book I gave her is on the table. I believe they would analyze that as leaving out the that. I know she's here, so that I know that she's here. That subordinator can be left out. But because we use these all the time, it seems to me we're as likely to fill it in in our brains as which, the book which I gave her is on the table, the book that I, they, they feel the same. And so I don't think it's worth pushing that point too hard but I'd like you to at least be aware of it so you don't get confused by the explanations they're giving. And that brings us almost to the end. There are other relativizing elements, and this would be, what, page 279, I guess, in the textbook, if I'm reading that right. So relative pronouns are what we've been talking about, things like who and which. And then the subordinator that, the woman that you saw as a professor. But then look at these two, because th these are in very distinctive constructions, and we'll need them to understand what's going on in next week's lecture. The prepositions when and where, they're prepositions. But they too can be relativized elements introducing relative clauses if they're preceded by a noun that they f refer back to directly. So I remember the moment when she arrived. When she arrived, a relative clause, but introduced by the preposition when. And the when refers back to the moment. I know the place where you live. The where is a uh, preposition, but it refers back li uh, directly back to the place, the noun. I know the place, direct object, obviously, right? Noun phrase, direct object, with a relative clause modifying it, which place the one where you lived. I know that one. And then finally, the adverb, I know the reason why she left. Reason uh, being what why is referring directly back to. So I think we've covered a lot of ground. There's some things that we'll have to work on in the self-checks.
but you need this cold to be able to do the more confusing work for next week. And then we're done with these, uh, these, these, not these finite subordinate clauses. Good luck. See you in class. <clears throat>